Hi, everyone. This fall, we got new proof that people are regularly and prodigiously tortured in Russia. Glogu.net project has released footage of inmates of Russian prisons being viciously beaten and raped. You can learn the details of how this video archive was obtained on the Glogu.net channel, as well as BBC's and Xenia Sobchak's channels. However, weirdly enough, it didn't quite shake the nation. Maybe it's because some find it hard to feel compassion for those serving time. But the reality is that torture is a real threat not only to people who'd never been in prison, but also those who had never broken the law. The reality is that in Russia, one day you could be minding your own business, then later that night find yourself tied to a chair at the police station, and in the morning confess to a crime you didn't commit. The episode you're about to watch will focus on this particular area. How the Russian police tortures people, often innocent ones. How exactly and why they torture them. How do you keep going after being tortured? Who are the people fighting this phenomenon? And ultimately, is there even a small chance that in the near future, this horror will be less common in Russia? <sighs> Let's go! Avia sales, my pals with plane tickets. Torture is one of the biggest words in Russia this year. You're one of the key and um, oldest scholars of torture in Russia. And we have many questions for you. Torture is finally being talked about. Uh, I understand it's not because it's become more common, but because of the internet and the technological revolution. It's much easier to make it public, right? Absolutely correct. But with a tiny asterisk. The intensity of torture is rising, and I think it's noticeable. People who deal with this and people who are now um, in the danger zone and because of their political work, uh, well, they... They know that one of these days they could meet this fate. And they, they are not criminals who always knew that it was a risk. You know, the cops get you, then they're beating the testimony out of you. People who never felt this threat now do. In reality, it always existed, but now they can actually feel it. They know that even if you are a former governor or an oligarch or whatever, tomorrow you could end up at the police station and experience it all firsthand. You said you owned a house in the Nizhny Novgorod woodlands and that if things went south, <laughs> you'd grab a gun and uh, hold the fort here. This is that woodland village, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, is it really going south? What do you oh, think? It's hard to tell. This pressurized tin can, by which I mean the political situation and the growing public discontent, it's bound to blow up. The government does everything to vex the people as much as possible. It's insane. They are nuts. I ended up with this house, or dacha, completely by chance. The thing is, I had a friend who, who had served in the police his entire life, and not just the police, but the Oman. It's interesting to think that we'd been what they call inseparable friends for 25 years. I met him in the most appropriate way for a fledgling Democrat of the late 1980s. He was the head of the squad uh, dispersing one of our rallies. He hit me in the face a couple of times with his baton, but as fate would have it, our paths crossed again the next day at our mutual friend's birthday. Well, I took him outside to return the favor, so <laughs> they quickly dragged us apart, of course. Wait, you went outside to thrash this cop? Well, of course. Earlier, he had his squad with him, with the so-called democratizers, as they called the batons, um, that the police just had gotten. Well, what could I do against him? Nothing, really. Just take the beating. This was different. I was like, let's have a proper talk, shall we? He bought the father's building for 10,000 rubles. And, uh, well, we'd come here to... Well, we told our wives that we were going hunting, and in reality we'd come here to shoot some guns and have some wine. Wine. Not wine, of course. <laughs> it's a fancy way of saying it. In short, the Committee for the Prevention of Torture is a team of lawyers, 
Yes. Who uh, get information from people who had been tortured and yes. help them to hold the people who exercised said torture uh, accountable. Well, to hold the torturers accountable and secure compensation from the state uh, for at least, uh, well, the emotional trauma, but often physical too. How many criminal cases did the Committee for the Prevention of Torture prompt? A little over 100 cases, as far as I can recall. Something like 150 officers charged, over 150 even. How many were sentenced? At least two-thirds, maybe a little over. Most sentenced to real jail time. What's the biggest sentence? To teenagers, I don't think they were even 18 at the time, so minors, found a construction job to build a house in this village. They didn't get paid in time and weren't even fed. One night they got brave and stole uh, a piglet from another villager and roasted the piglet on a campfire. The next morning uh, they arrested them and brought them in and uh, they beat one of them to death. And the police did? The police did. This was done on the case officer's direct orders. Case officers uh, typically don't dirty their hands. This is done by the field staff. The case officer summons their field colleagues and says, attend to these guys. Um, get them to confess, basically. Well, uh, the field officers overdid it, and our mission was fairly simple. We did our best to remove the obstacles that always emerge in torture investigations investigations because uh, they always have patrons and friends in high places, so to say. In a number of cases, we established with certainty that a certain sum of secret cash intended for these situations had been uh, transferred to the case officer. Maybe it's more seldom now, but they definitely used to have unofficial police unions that stepped in in uh, situations like that. Well, and, it sounds uh, like a gang cash pool. It does. Not every case officer would take gang money, but, um, well, accepting money from these police gangs is, um, it is considered appropriate and justifiable. They sentenced uh, the field officers, but this was a unique situation where we managed to prove that, uh, in fact, it was the case officer behind it all, and uh, he got sentenced for 14 years. But some people might watch this and say, but the boys were guilty. They stole the piglet. Yes. Yes, it was worth 30,000 rubles. Of course, they did wrong. And uh, I'll be honest that uh, most of our, our claimants, uh, these torture victims, they uh, don't have angel wings. Well, let's put it like that. They're no saints, they're torture victims. They've been violated, they had things done to them that should never be done to a person under no circumstances, but most of the time they are real offenders who'd broken the law in some way or were inadequate towards the police officer or refused to present the ID or talked back in a rude way. And, uh, well, for that they got crippled, or raped, or raped and tortured. On our way to your place, uh, we noticed this house over here. I was sure it's a store or a government building, but it's actually residential. Yeah, 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 with this patriotic paint job. Uh, is it true that you were the first or among the first in Nizhny Novgorod to uh, rally with the Russian flag? Yeah. Guilty um, as charged. Uh, do tell, it was 1989, right? Yes, May the 1st, 1989, the first rising of the tricolor after 70 years under the Soviets. They, of course, halted us, um, apprehended and packed us in police vans. They took us to different police stations, and compared to today, there was nothing extreme. It was all very cordial. They had a different thing back then. If you did something like that, uh, you were pretty much as good as dead to your country. Your career is done. Yes, exactly. Let's yeah, clarify yeah. for others and myself, a, a big fan of these three stripes here. Uh, back then, it was basically an extremist flag, right? 
Don't well, uh, the white uh, Could you flag. imagine that just three years later... Well, of course gone? not. Of course not. Furthermore, I was uh, an engineering student. I worked at the Chemistry Institute of the Science Academy. Besides, I'd gotten back from the army. I knew perfectly well that after this flag episode, there would be no more engineering. Is it true that all the Siloviki in whom this flag triggered aggression and, uh, and, and hostility and whatnot, so... Uh, three years later, they continued to work in their positions under this flag. Yes, exactly. None of them took their shoulder straps off over a flag. When the person comes to us, they talk with the head of the investigation department, who assigns an attorney to their case. Then the attorney and the claimant head over here. We believe it's vital to facilitate a trusting relationship early on. The claimant knowing that this particular attorney will be working on their case, will repeatedly and in full detail tell them the horrible story that happened to them. This is like the room of distress then? Yes, yes, absolutely. A manhunt notice? He's been hunted for six years now, I believe. We used to have this infamous penal facility, uh, G-U-F-S-I-N-I-K-14 of Nizhny Ovgorod Oblast. It was feared like hell itself. Things that we recently saw with this video archive uh, that was leaked online with the torture in that Saratov prison, this Nizhny Novgorod prison had all of it. And just like in Saratov, nobody ever complains. They raped people, at least six people were killed, they had fabricated paperwork saying that they had died from natural causes or something like that. One died of heart failure, another one of something else, and uh, somebody had broken ribs for some reason. This is the head of butcher and torture of the Volga region. He oversaw this stuff, right? He oversaw it. He ran it. He was basically a god there. Uh, he decided whether somebody lived or died. He's on the run. Uh, when they finally launched the investigation, he uh, absconds. We looked for him uh, tirelessly and ultimately found him in Ukraine. He's currently under house arrest, as far as I know, in uh, Kyiv. Seeking political He's asylum. seeking political asylum. We are doing everything to prevent it. We found some colleagues in Ukraine, their local human rights defenders. We sent them everything we had on this bastard. Uh, does he claim that he's being persecuted by Putin himself? I don't know what he claims, but since he's seeking political asylum, then, yeah, he's probably a victim of Putin's bloodthirsty regime. Luda, uh, you managed the committee's archive. Is correct. that correct? Uh, how did you end up here? When I was studying at our local law college, we had all kinds of professors and practical lessons, and the only person who really made their work sound interesting was Anton Rajov, who simultaneously taught international law and was on the Committee for the Prevention of Torture. Back then, I was convinced that I'd make a mistake when I chose law as my future career. This man was the thread that I grabbed onto real tight. He told us about these heroic human rights defenders who had a smidgen of the state's resources in terms of muscle, money and uh, everything else were fighting uh, quite concrete evils, particularly in Chechnya. I heard tons of stories about human rights defenders and Kadyrov. It made a huge impression on me, and I decided that I wanted to work with these guys. And I didn't even care what I'd be doing here. Had they told me, Luda, there's an opening for a cleaning lady, I would have taken it too. Alexei, uh, we're doing this interview via Skype uh, because we cannot meet you in person right now, correct? Which is why I'm very grateful for you agreeing to do this interview remotely, because my immune system is shut. I live with my mother. We both barely go outside to avoid the direct contact. So the coronavirus is particularly dangerous for you? Yes, we both had it. 
It's uh, doubly dangerous because we know what it's like. There is a percentage of people who didn't break the law at all, completely nothing, and simply were in the wrong place at the wrong time. It so happened that the first person whose case we put our hands on was a traffic safety officer with the police. In 1998, I joined the traffic police force. It was uh, an exam period. When we were done with the exams, my friend and I went to his uh, dacha, which, where we bring groceries to his parents. The road lay through this small town. We went to stretch our legs and picked up these two girls. Well, they were locals from this little town. We told them that we were heading to Nizhny Novgorod. We, we went for a ride. One of them told us where to drop her off, got out and, uh, uh, as I know now, went home. The second girl went to Nizhny Novgorod with us. I dropped her off at the bus stop near my place and she disappeared. First day of work at the traffic police, got my uniform, my gun, and the chief says, head over to the police. They want you for questioning. I came down to the station. They said, uh, a girl was missing. I, I didn't try to hide it. I told them everything that happened. The girl never came home. Well, she went missing. I explained that I dropped her off at the bus stop near my place. I happened to be the last person to see her. They arrested me right there at the station. My chief came down with, uh, with paperwork for me to sign that I'd been fired from the police retrospectively. He said if things cleared up, we'd just destroy this piece of paper. But if you turn out to be a criminal, well, then you are not police material and it's best for you if, uh, if you are fired. Uh, since I didn't feel guilty and knew I had done nothing wrong, signing something like that didn't bother me. The stupid and naive kid that I was, because I was only 21, I signed this paper and quit retrospectively. So they immediately charged me with uh, rape and murder of this girl. They uh, launched a criminal case since my friend was with me at the time. They interrogated him too. And uh, so to this day, I don't know why he gave this testimony. Maybe they tortured or threatened him or something like that. But he said, I did indeed rape and murder this girl. Uh, also that uh, I made him rape her. And he vividly, extremely vividly described the murder itself. He mentioned things that a non-murderer couldn't know. The police officers handed me the transcript of his interview and said, look, your friend confessed that you killed this girl. The slapping started, emptying ashtrays on my head, calling me names, calling me names, spitting jabbing i i didn't confess killing her then then they put me in uh, well they said uh, we're not going to dirty our own hands beating you into pulp so they put me in a cell with uh, recidivists is it so I told them that I was a police officer and that I was supposed to be held separately or with other officers. They laughed, of course, and said, well, buddy, if you don't confess tomorrow, the recidivist will learn that you are a police officer held in a cell with them for rape. Try and guess what they'll do to you by morning. And so... I had no reason to doubt their words, because everything they promised, they did. The things they did to him over those 10 days, it was hell. And creative officers and prosecutors kept tossing more logs into the flames.
You mentioned that being tortured with electricity will make you confess to anything. Yes. So it's physically unbearable. Well, it's physically bearable for a certain amount of time. First zap, second, third. Sooner or later, after yet another zap, the person breaks. Because you can't bear it for too long. Do they still torture like that? Yes, of course. They brought me to the Leninsky District Police Station in uh, Nizhny Novgorod, attached me to this machine, clamped my earlobes, plugged the machine, handcuffed me and uh, put me on a chair backwards and put my uh, handcuffed hands around the back. One of the officers held me down by the shoulders so I couldn't get up. The, the other one... Well, well, the other one turned the machine on and... I got I got zapped by an electric current. Since the wires were clamped to my ears, the current went through my brain and every part of my body started to twitch. My eyelids started to contract 50 times a second. All my muscles started to contract 50 times a second. My facial muscles, my arms and legs, all my muscles basically. They uh, they torture you with electricity, then ask again, do you confess to the murder or not? If you don't, if you endure it, they dial it up and make the zap stronger and longer. You start to lose consciousness. You come to and get interrogated again. And uh, eventually, I obviously couldn't take any more torture and confess to raping and murdering this girl. At some point... The torture ended, then another policeman came in and said that some higher-ups wanted to interrogate me, uh, deputy prosecutor of the region came over, a general in rank, and deputy head of uh, Gouverde, a major general. And they took me to another room to talk to them, I recognized them, I'd met them in person, so... I told them that I didn't kill or rape anyone. I said I was being tortured, that they tortured me with electricity. I was, uh, I was telling deputy prosecutor of the region that I was being tortured, but, but he pretended that uh, he didn't hear any of it. And he pretended like I wasn't even in the room. And he said to the policeman that tortured and brought me to him, I don't think he understands yet. Just keep torturing him until he confesses. They took me back to the first room and the officers openly laughed at me and said, complaining to the prosecutor, he personally ordered your torture. Didn't you hear it? And I realized I had no one to complain to. And when they started torturing me again, I obviously confessed to raping and killing this girl. I'm thinking the officers wanted to use me as their career booster. They decided to sacrifice me as a dirty cop. Uh, they decided to present me as a serial killer. They offered me to confess to four more unsolved murders. Uh, can you imagine this story in the 90s when they caught a cop uh, who was a mass murderer and rapist? They started torturing me again. I signed a confession to, to four more murders. They also demanded the body, the body of the girl uh, that I supposedly raped and murdered. I told them that I'd uh, confess to anything, but I couldn't give them the body of uh, somebody that I didn't kill. They continued to torture me with electricity. I was barely conscious after 10 days of... Uh, of constant pressure and increasing intensity of torture. I can't remember this. We were on the third floor. I was sitting on a chair. There were two desks in front of me. I guess my survival instincts kicked in because I realized I, I was dying. I gathered the remainder of my strength and jumped out of the window. It was a double window, not like modern plastic ones, but two separate frames. I didn't break the glass, I flew through it. I left my outline in the glass. Like from a bullet? Like a hole from a bullet, yes. I, uh, it was the same as... Uh, the glass didn't break, I flew through it with such force that I left my 
outline in it. I flew through, I fell three stories and landed on my, on my back, broke my spine. The ambulance arrived, they immediately uncuffed me and uh, took me to the hospital. They put me in a room and told everybody that I was a serial killer and they forbade people to approach or talk to me. Paul agencies regularly ask the population if it's okay for the police to torture people. The numbers are really big. Here are the latest ones. This is the percentage of people that allow torture in certain situations. What would you tell them? What can I tell them? First off, I'd uh, turn their attention to the seemingly obvious paradox. The court decides whether the person is guilty after the investigation. If you use torture during the investigation, you have to understand that torture will unmask anybody, me, you, anybody, as a pedophile or a terrorist by the next morning. I don't know what special cases they mean. These well, ones? Well, probably these ones. Well, there you go. If you run an electric current through Yuri Dut the right way, by tomorrow morning, probably even earlier, but tomorrow morning for sure, he will confess to crucifying Christ, assassinating JFK, killing Vlad Listy, if anything. Thank you so much, Igor, uh, for the tip. Welcome to reality. I immediately want to ask, let's picture a situation. You catch a serial killer, CCTV clearly shows it's him. Mm -hmm. And the little girl he took somewhere is missing. Only he knows where she is. What do you do? Law forbids torture, regardless of circumstances. You can legally kill, you can uh, shoot to kill, you can't torture. If you are asking me personally, then my answer is this. In this situation, I would break the law, save the little girl, and then turn myself in. And, and then... And make a written confession. They would charge me with torture, I'd be in uh, to do three to ten years, and I really hope that the court would show leniency considering I saved this little girl, that I had uh, sure evidence. I don't know of a single story where they had 100% sure evidence, and this heroic police officer decided to break the law with this. They don't have any proof, they have fantasies, and they know it. They are not afraid to make a mistake. That's the problem. That surprises me. You have to be absolutely certain that the person before you is a criminal. Gleb Zhiglov was a criminal too. Of course. Because he planted the wallet on brick. Falsification of the evidence. For three days, none of the doctors would come near me. Three days later, they suddenly removed the guards. I got medical attention, I had uh, a surgery, they did a surgery on my spine, they began treatment, the, the case officer came to visit, I said, uh, what happened? He said, the girl turned up, she's home, safe and sound, the girl I supposedly murdered. Here's what happened. It was her birthday. She went to see her friends, I'm guessing she party too hard and uh, I later learned from the case files that she had lost something, a necklace or a coat and was afraid to go home because her mom would have been furious. And she didn't return home for several days uh, at home. Yeah, So 10 days she stayed with, this, uh, with her mates and because this was before the cell phones, they, they began looking for her this way. Uh, these officers wanted to find a way to, to put me in jail. They tried talking to this girl. Maybe he tied you up. Maybe he wouldn't let you go. They interrogated her. She only said that she... When they brought her to see me, she only said she was thankful for giving her a ride. And, of course, I didn't keep her captive or rape or kill her. All their criminal cases fell apart. They had nothing, absolutely nothing on me. Did they give you any health predictions? 
Uh, no, nobody told me anything. After the surgery, my mom came up to the doctor and asked him if, uh, well, if I would be all right. He said, uh, be strong, ma'am. You'll be lucky if he can sit up. If he can sit up, he'll be mobile with a wheelchair. But we can't tell yet whether he'd be able to sit or not. The prediction was a vegetable, bedridden, with um, only with with the neck moving. If if you are curious about my full diagnosis, besides the broken spine, I can tell you. Broken spine isn't just a paralysis. It's also all internal all organs below the fracture zone typically cease to function. Like in my case, with lumbar fracture, everything below that ceases to function. So you have uh, impaired pelvic organ function. Basically, I can't go number one or number two by myself. So, my, my life is basically a bathroom break to bathroom break with catheterization every two hours. So, well, you get the picture. They did a whole show about this on uh, Channel 1 and uh, Channel 2. Some parts of this show were broadcast in Norway and the Norwegian Police Labour Union uh, found the money they fundraised uh, to bring Mikhaev over to Norway to have surgery in Oslo's main hospital, uh, which was, uh, well, it was a really... Uh, Norwegian Police Labour Union? That's right. That's right. That sounds surreal. It's not even that it sounds surreal. The thing is that today it would have been uh, enough r a reason to label us as foreign agents. Back then it was possible, but today... How they invited me? Well, we met with uh, this Norwegian journalist. We spoke and this situation seriously rattled him. He became engrossed in this story and shared it back in Norway on television. And this Norwegian Police F Foundation responded as, as colleagues, basically. And since, uh, and since I was with the Russian police, a fellow, a fellow officer that responded and wanted to help. And this Norwegian Police Foundation, together with the journalist, uh, they, well, they raised the money and invited me to come to Norway for treatments. They found a doctor in Norway and they were shocked. Why are you like this after an injury? Did you fall into a gorge or so somewhere? Did it take days to find you? Why didn't they operate on you for so long? All neurosurgeons knew this. You bring the person to the hospital and do the simplest procedure. You just puncture the skin on the back and, and release the blood. You know, the hematoma from the fall was compressing the spine. Uh, they only needed to release the blood to relieve the pressure on the spinal cord. Then, then it would wither. And because they didn't let doctors treat me for three days, uh, my spinal cord began to wither because of the hematoma compressing it. This could have been a mere fracture. My bones would have fused back and I would have walked. It wasn't the kind of injury that leads to being like this. I mean, I mean, put the blame on the doctors? I wouldn't, because the police officers si simply didn't let them treat me. They, the doctors knew what needed to be done. And as I've learned since, we have brilliant doctors here in Russia. Uh, you mean, had they let the doctors treat you, it's most likely this wouldn't have happened and you would have walked? Yes, yes. The fracture would have fused back. Bones in the spine are like any other bone. They would have fused back like normal. That's it. You learned about torture firsthand in the 90s, didn't you? Was it electricity? No, no, it wasn't electricity. They just uh, whaled me uh, almost nonstop for a full day. I was uh, a suspect in some sort of a larceny case. 
And, uh, well, uh, between the beatings, they openly told me, until we catch the real one, I mean, I think I even managed to convince them that I, I didn't do it. Somebody else from your firm stole it. Yes. Well, he didn't even steal anything. He only planned a grand larceny. You said they held you hostage. Well, that's what they told me. It was a figure of speech. We'll keep you hostage. I mean, the policemen, or the militia, as they were called back then. You're going to stay in the isolation ward until, well, if we catch the real crook, well, you can count yourself lucky. If we don't, well, then you're in for 15 years. Did they catch him? I was lucky. They did. And they let you go? They let me go. Uh, did the person do time? Well, uh, probation, I believe. Uh, But uh, he managed to steal a considerable sum of money, which uh, I think he used to pay uh, the judge. Did your paths cross after that? One time, randomly. Uh, the person who was the reason yeah, uh, yeah, you yeah. were tortured? Yeah, we both knew that. I mean, uh, he didn't apologize. <laughs> If that's what you were asking. In most cases, police officers say we didn't beat or torture anybody, it's all lies. And those of them who do plead guilty, they explain their actions the following way. Most of the time, it's mental and emotional exhaustion that, uh, that police officers vent at their, at their victims' expense. I had this defendant police officer in Orenburg who said, I couldn't handle the seven-day marathon on duty. The higher-ups wanted solved cases, they wanted constant work, I was exhausted. So when I saw this drunk arrestee, I started pounding him right there in the van. They sentenced him for to three years in prison. He, he said, the higher-ups made my life miserable. I was out of it. I didn't know what I was doing. These excuses typically work in favor of these poor types, if you will, because somebody who struck once will strike again. It's the same with domestic violence. Forget beating is loving. Beating is beating. Same thing here. If somebody used torture once, they'll probably use it again, because the profit is quite considerable. What is the workflow of a police officer who wishes to operate within the law like? They need to question everybody, they need to examine everything, they need to send out inquiries and wait to get the responses. They need to study the findings and file more inquiries or reports. This takes time and effort. It's much easier to sit the person down, put clamps on their earlobes, uh, turn on the current and 15 minutes later they'll confess to anything and it works. And, and if it works, Why bother investigating and proving the crime? You see, they turn themselves in, which is the master of proof. Nothing's changed since the 1930s. You posted a video last year with uh, Slovakia's most like ridiculous excuses uh, for torture. When the combat techniques were used against Baronin, he broke free, after which he deliberately dropped on the ground and rolled around, hitting his head on the tree roots and other objects. They beat one RST to death. They, uh, well, they hit him uh, on the head too. He started having terrible headaches. He literally screamed in pain. And they had some kind of inspection, the prosecutor visits or whatever. They dragged him away so the prosecutor wouldn't hear him. And uh, they threw him in a sweat box. It's a punishment cell in detention centers. They uh, dragged him to the sweat box and they told the medical staff, just ignore the screaming. When When the prosecutor leaves, we'll uh, figure out what to do with him. Maybe we'll take him to the hospital or call an ambulance, but for now... And after four hours of screaming and rolling, he died. And in agony. In the ruling, they wrote that uh, there was this board standing, and he was walking across the hall, performing his duties as a chairman, somebody who cards the cows to sales, and uh, this board fell on him and he died. Well, unfortunately, an oversight. Didn't set the board properly. Same story, then it turned out that uh, he had two fatal injuries. The board must have fallen twice. 
Accidentally fell from a tree when sowing branches. Got injured after falling from a truck. Struck his own foot with a paperclip. Knocked over a cabinet in a hallway. Got killed by a falling board. When somebody comes to us and says the police tortured me, we don't take their word for it, which draws some people's criticism. What is wrong with you? The person's clearly beaten up. They say they've been tortured. Let's take to the streets. Well, no. Hold on. We'll figure it out. We'll question the person and the witnesses. We'll find out where they were before the arrest. Maybe they were beaten up before the arrest. Or maybe they left the police station and asked some friends to beat him up to slur the police. You got to make sure before you start flinging accusations for things the police didn't do. This one time in Nizhny Novgorod, a person came in and went, the police beat me up, here's the medical paperwork, let's put them in jail. We went to the police, where they told us nobody touched him, here's the footage from the police car. And, uh, well, and indeed, we saw the claimant suddenly start slamming into the car's pillars, going, you're all going down, calling the officers obscene words. We got a copy of the footage, called him in and went, what is this? Why are you lying? He said, oh, uh, uh, well, sorry, and left. And actually, this entire time that we've been investigating torture reports, besides scrutinizing the authorities' version that there was no torture, we also scrutinized the claimant's version. Sergey, uh, You're the head of the Committee for the Prevention of Torture in Krasnodar. Correct. Torture in Krasnodar cry. Is it a major problem today? Absolutely. Even looking at stories in the media, being in the midst of all of it, uh, severity, brutality, methods of um, carrying out uh, violence and the cynicism are the... What are the methods? Uh, How well, do they torture in Krasnodar? Every other claimant reports torture with electricity. Unlawful arrests, evidence tampering, administrative offenses, um, battery. We have districts where we get three, four, five claimants and the sixth one. I literally stopped this claimant and said, you came to the station, can I tell you what happened next? And based on the five previous claimant reports, I described to this person how they were tortured. They brought them in the room, threw them on the floor, put their hands behind their back, put a chair between uh, their arms and started beating them. Closed an electric circuit with their fingertips. It just feels like somebody trains these cops to do this. I swear to you, in 30 years I hadn't been arrested once. I didn't know stuff like this still existed. I thought it died with the 90s. They brought me inside, put a gas mask on me, handcuffed me, spread me on the floor and put a chair to hold my arms. The door opened, it was uh, Sherbakov. Sherbakov is the deputy head of criminal investigations, the biggest sadist. He comes up to me and goes, so, are you ready to confess? In 2015, the police arrested four people in Anapa, Artyom Ponomarchuk among them, and charged them with armed robbery. And, as the guys told us, uh, they, uh, they were brought to the police station and tortured for hours. Artyom Ponomarchuk told us that besides battery and torture with uh, electricity by connecting to various body parts, he was also raped. There was a lengthy internal inspection. They got 11 rulings to dismiss the criminal case, after which they did open it. Then they got four more rulings to suspend the case. Then four rulings to dismiss the criminal case. They are on the fifth ruling to dismiss the case, which we haven't gotten overruled yet. My colleagues are currently appealing this ruling in the Cassation Courts. They say the odds are slim and they'll probably have to take this case to the European Court of Human Rights. Then the main polygraph guy walked in and started hitting me on the head. He started throwing slurs, said my last name was Ukrainian, started punching me in the head for that. I saw that they were drinking, the police officers, uh, celebrating something. They were drinking in the last office on the right. They kept on drinking and drinking. I noticed that they were tipsy. They knocked me on the floor again. 
pulled my pants down and said, we're going to shove a baton in, you know, the anus. Before they changed the gas mask on me, I noticed a strong smell of alcohol in the room. Then I realized that they're, they're gone completely crazy. They pulled my pants and underwear down. One of them said, take it out. I didn't get what he meant. I got it later. He said, wrap the stick with duct tape, lubricate it so you don't rip it. After that, they stuck a baton up my anus. According to Ponomarchuk, the charges against them were changed from armed robbery to fraud. The court is currently hearing the case against these four guys. Since 2015, all four have been limited in mobility, like uh, house arrest. Uh, one of the defendants uh, spent almost two years in a detention center, then went under house arrest. Three of them are currently banned from moving for four years now. No, more than five years, actually. Uh, they have all been limited in mobility and the trial is moving along very, very slowly. When is going to be over? Nobody knows. In 2019, Extreme South came out, where your story is told in full detail. The four of you worked at a wholesale warehouse. And one uh, December day, the police arrested and started torturing you in order to get you to confess to an armed robbery of a uh, sales rep. Yes. You confessed. Uh, then you four and your families decided to fight back. It's been two and a half years since the documentary came out. Instead of armed robbery, they now charge you with fraud. Yes. Uh, the sales rep is now a suspect too, is that right? Yes, they claim that we staged an armed robbery. What about the damage? The combined damage from two incidents is about two million. Cigarettes? Yes, cigarettes. He goes, if you testify against the guys that you worked with, saying that they did it, we'll keep you until the end of this month and release you. No corpus delicti. Their actions uh, were lawful and justified. Nobody beaten or tortured them. Uh, they are attempting to evade criminal prosecution. It's a classic terminology that they'll always fall back on. I, oh, I was tortured. You just want to avoid prison. But I have injuries. You scratch the wound, you hit your head on the tree roots and other stuff like that. Fell down some stairs. We had this case in uh, Marielle where the investigators' report said that police officers arrested the person and during the arrest they slammed into the baton on the police officer's belt, leaving a baton mark on particular parts of the body. Like the joke, the victim fell on the knife 40 times. There you go, real life joke. They uncuffed me and Two police officers dictated to me my guilty statement and two clarification notes that I got my injuries from falling in some bushes. That's what his wrists look like. They festered badly. It's from the handcuffs and the electricity connected to them. These grooves were like finger deep. Here's a close-up. Both wrists... That's his lower back. When we took this picture, I asked him what that was. He said that there were electricity marks. It's when they attached clamps to my back with something and turned the power on. I understand you cannot leave the city. Is that correct? Can't leave the region. So uh, for six years, you uh, haven't been able to go to Moscow or on vacation somewhere? Yes. So your life has basically been on hold these six years. Man, Yura, to be honest, uh, a lot of things happened in my life during this time, during this trial. When I was under house arrest, it was constant stress. I've got uh, anxiety-induced diabetes. I saw a therapist for about a year. I met with a therapist from Nizhny Novgorod with, uh, with the Committee for the Prevention of Torture. For the last 18 months, I've been taking antidepressants. You told what exactly they did to you at the police station. Uh, and you told how they violated you. Yura, 
I understood something. If, uh, if nobody talks, nothing's going to change. You know, if you don't talk, you won't be heard. They won't trust you. It happened, period. So what, I, I should hang myself, despise myself? I'm the same person as before. It didn't change me. Did you manage to get anyone uh, convicted? We recently got our very first case to trial against two traffic officers. We have about 10 more open criminal cases, but in these five years, no police officers have been convicted yet. Some might say, five years and no results. What's yeah. the point of all this? Well, good question. It's like, let's look at the KPI, uh, the, the real results. It's rough not only in terms of statistics and math, it's rough on our staff too. You work year after year, you have tons of proof. I worked in Nizhny Novgorod. With the proof that we have in Kubain right now, they would have sentenced at least five uh, officers over there. It's much harder to do it here in Kubain. But why? Nepotism. Nepotism, among other things, uh, tight connections between officers in the police, the investigative committee and the prosecution service. Simple example, we are at an investigative procedure, a face-to-face -face confrontation, the case officer is typing something, the accused policeman is over here, the confrontation ends, they start discussing work-related stuff. Obviously, the case officer is not interested in prosecuting this policeman because they work in the street. If he pressures him and tries to prosecute him, the field officer will go, hey, what, what gives? I work in the streets. I bring you information and witnesses. I'm not going to work. And the way they investigate these cases shows that the investigative committee staff is not interested in prosecuting police officers. Why do you think nothing's changed? They made a documentary about you. It's been watched 50,000 times. It's not a small number. As I understand, you have all the medical proof that you were actually tortured. I understand you have alibis. All of you or most of you do. We all do. Why are you still suspects uh, despite all that? I'm pretty sure they are stalling it. My trial is moving along at a rate of one quarter meeting a month. It would take from nine to ten years for the term of this trial to run out. If this time runs out, nobody will be punished. They'll come out clean, you see? Well, okay, they just... Like nothing happened to us. The strategy is to stall for as long as possible to abuse the statute of limitation. Yes, I believe that's what they are doing, because they don't have any other options. Anapa is a small town. In these six years, have you crossed paths with any of the police officers that you met that night at the station? Yes, of course. You just passed each other in the street. Yes. I don't know. I'm angry at them. They just walk by, smiling in your face. And they don't say anything? No. They're wary. They don't want to say something that they shouldn't. Before we hire someone, uh, we have this mandatory lecture course uh, with, uh, with an exam and uh, a follow-up internship. Uh, he couldn't pass the exam. Uh, he took it several times. Uh, Eventually, he got mad at us and left. The man was twisted beyond belief. During training, we noticed that he had an odd memory. He couldn't internalize this information that torture is always wrong. He couldn't memorize uh, related laws. I am absolutely certain that uh, I've seen both sides of the coin when, uh, when it comes to violence. I've been tortured both by cops and bandits. I know how human memory works in these situations. Initially, it's simply unpleasant to recall. After several months, you lose the ability to. You get some, some sort of an amnesia. If you try really hard, you can remember certain details, but not the, uh, not the actual, like uh, the gangsters uh, tied the wire around my arms and plugged uh, in the socket. When I later testified to the cops as, uh, as the victim, I couldn't recognize any of them in the pictures.
Does amnesia happen to the victim yes. or everyone yes. involved? The victim. No, uh, victims always suffer from amnesia. That's a medical fact. But I think that the people um, at the other end, the policemen, also develop a sort of a reflex to push uh, these things uh, out of their memory. I don't think uh, it's easy to live with this either. If you torture people again and again, I think you too develop this reflex that preserves uh, your mind and your sanity. And as a result of this, a uh, person sort of, sort of forgets it really fast. Like I never did yes, it. Yes, like I never did it. Tell me, what needs to happen for these cops to be properly prosecuted? Or, at the very least, I don't know, the case against you for, like, dropped? What I think Moscow needs to pick up and look into this case. Case officers have a limited time to solve a case. It is one year to look into it. If it goes beyond that time, they have to send a request to Moscow to extend the time to look into it. But they don't do it. Nobody went to Moscow. Because if it reaches Moscow, they'll send an inspection and these guys are done. They are afraid to show this case to Moscow because they have nothing. You believe that if the main directorate of MVD learns about your case, they'll send an inspection to Anapa and this might help you? I believe so, yes. But I understand there is now a new category of people that should be wary of torture, uh, political prisoners. Political activists, more exactly. They face torture long before any kind of court convicts them. Pretty much uh, since the moment they engage in political activity. If you go out on a square somewhere and hold up a free Navalny poster, uh, you'll get the beaten up. The things they're doing to Navalny in Pokrov. Is it torture too? Absolutely. Nobody beats him, but the kinds of things described in the Rain documentary, I mean, like, his cellmates won't talk to him. Uh, somebody follows him everywhere, repeating his every word to annoy him. They strip him 300 times a day. Or they disturb his sleep. Uh, they film they him. They film him, yeah. Um, like uh, frying sausages uh, or pieces of bread next to him that... Uh, During his hunger strike. Yes, particularly. Uh, these methods uh, they used to get him to end his hunger strike with the smell and stuff. Well, uh, I, I, I chuckle because it's a, the exact methods described in specialist literature. A person on hunger strike, particularly two or three days into it responds very acutely to the smell of fried food. Specialist literature? An entire team of scientists in the US was commissioned by the government to uh, research this subject. What methods of intense questioning exist uh, where you don't leave any signs of physical abuse on the person or I, or ideally eliminate physical contact entirely. They ended up with some interesting findings. You can break almost anyone, but some men break when uh, they see that they're about to lose an eye. When you hold the tip of a knife next to their eye and they realize that this is happening, that this knife is about to plunge into their eye. For group A, this is their unbearable torture. For group B, the unbearable torture is the threat to lose their balls. They tie a rope and hang him up, and uh, since he's hanging, if they drop him, uh, the balls rip off. All men can't bear one or the other. So that's, that's well, Americans. Americans did this research to later use it. Yes, yes. In Guantanamo. I don't know if it was for Guantanamo or not. I have a strong suspicion that they had places much worse than Guantanamo. During wartime, like in Iraq, for example, they did absolutely monstrous things. Okay, someone might hear this and go, you see, and you badmouth the Russian investigative committee. Even the democratic Americans that you all love so much did it. I mean, look at them. They even wrote guidelines for that. Yeah, so? 
It's the twisted kind of logic where it's like, um, why should I go to jail? I'm not an armed robber. Others out there actually kill people. Brilliant logic. And uh, when it comes to America, if we do go down this line, at least uh, in America, human rights defenders found out about this, made it public uh, information and a matter of public discussion. Mr. Obama's election campaign was built around, well, not entirely, but largely around his uh, indignation and promise, like, if I'm elected, I'll put an end to this. I'll put an end to it and I'll investigate it. The US will drop this practice. Did he investigate it? He did. Did he end it? No. Well, officially, it's been discontinued. People who did those things were not convicted. Obama himself said that uh, they will not punish the people involved in torture and abuse, but the US will never do it again. Of course, some time needs to pass and this law needs to be enforced. New offenders, each and every one, need to be punished and uh, the nation, particularly the law enforcement agencies like the MP and others, need to hear about those punishments. Then this law will become self-sustaining. For now, there needs to be an additional enforcement of this law to start working. It's because they don't do this in Russia that, because we have the laws, and unlike in the US, nobody here really tried to legalize the torture, but they don't need to because they don't care about the laws. They know very well that torture is only banned on paper. Do not cover your neighbor's wife. That's the level of the urgency. You did? Oh, well. What are you going to do about it? Maybe some annoying deputy will go, you don't do that, it's, it's wrong. But nobody will get punished. The law says three to ten years, but they will serve zero. The barbell, punching bag. By the end of the day, you are overflowing with unhealthy amounts of anger, particularly if you've been uh, at a courthouse or at an interrogation with a defendant whose case you're working on. Uh, some hit the barbell, uh, but most prefer the bag. When you see somebody punching it, you can tell they're not punching it as just sports equipment. Some picture me in its place. I know that well. Have you learned to be more calm about the things you put in the database? To be honest, no. This thing where you become really cynical after a while and learn to only notice specific details about these stories, you know, just register the facts, so... Like a doctor. Yeah, like a doctor. I never learned to do that. Uh, the original trigger that brought me to the committee in the first place has become my curse in a way. Uh, for example, I never learned to not care about the stories from Chechnya. Never no. learned. They were the most horrifying for me, and they still are to this day. I think a human rights defendant uh, doesn't necessarily need to get rid of these feelings to be good at what they do, because otherwise you become a machine. Our job, and I often tell this to my colleagues, is nine to five distress. You come to work thinking about torture and you leave work thinking about torture. Over the years, the way you interact with your family changes. For example, when I come home, I have this routine. My child doesn't run up to me. I go straight away to the bathroom. I wash up, take a shower, take five, ten minutes to calm down. Then I go to my family. That's my routine. We all have our own ways of weathering stress within our families. All right, you mentioned that you're bound to spend a year or two in prison. Likely to, but not bound to, God forbid. I really hope to avoid this fate, uh, but the way things are going, it seems plausible. Why are you so sure? 
I see the changing attitude of the authorities towards uh, human rights defenders. I can see all the traps that they've set up that you'll um, sooner or later inevitably fall into. They pass the law on undesirable organizations. I mean, you have... Uh, the law itself is idiotic, but the way it's enforced is even worse. Say you run a joint project with an organization from Czech Republic, Paraguay or somewhere else. Two years later, for reasons unknown to anyone, nobody knows them, nor I, nor this Czech organization, the prosecution service declares this organization undesirable for reasons that nobody knows. Then, two years later, they prosecute you because two years before the ruling, you worked with this organization. It's nonsense. What is this law meant to do? It is meant to deter you from even thinking about collaborating with any foreigners and especially foreign human rights-oriented organizations. Avoid any contacts. You're basically preparing yourself for prison. How hard is it psychologically? As a human rights advocate, I always ran the risk, even in the best years, even in uh, 2010 or 11, it was always a risk. When I was starting out, uh, it was greater. In uh, 2010 or 11, it was lower. Today, we are back to the Soviet levels of risk. Back in Soviet times, you went to prison for a long time for what we now call human rights advocacy. Now, uh, it's all coming back. I never ruled out this possibility. It's just that recently, it's gotten particularly worrisome. What's the pay in the committee like? Depends on the job for inspectors and heads. The upper limits are 60 and 90,000, respectively. Where does the committee get its funding? The Committee for the Prevention of Torture gets funding from several business entities. Foreign? Of course not. Of course not. The committee cannot get foreign funding because they'll put it in jail. So, naturally, there are not foreign entities. Hold on, but you said that it was funded by grants. It used to be. Now, uh, they're not called grants, they're called donations. The Committee for the Prevention of Torture can only take donations from Russian entities. So it does. Where they get the money, I don't ah. know. But Wait, uh, but very recently on Echo of Moscow Radio and elsewhere, you said yourself that yeah. they're grants. Yes. Basically from foreign governments. No, not governments. Okay, affiliated yeah, with yeah, governments. Yeah, yeah. But you even used to list them in your open financial reports. Yes. Is that correct? Yes, 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 yes. Did something change? Yes, of course. Foreign agent laws and undesirable organization laws have changed. To conform to these laws, you can't take money from foreigners. That's right. Even if they're Russian-born foreigners like the Zimmin family. Uh, this is the example I was going to bring up. I mean, uh, well, he's super patriotic. He's a superb manager. He founded his business on probably the most important and rare thing in Russia, on advanced technologies and high-tech business. For obvious reasons, he moved uh, his money abroad and from that offshore account funded Russian uh, sciences generously too, both uh, fundamental and applied sciences, as well as college education. Because he supplied grants for college students and student groups, they declared him a foreign agent. It's like... I just want to smash their faces, which I probably promised to do to the deputy that enacted this law. Mm. You sounded a bit like the people you fight just now. Violence in response to madness. I mean, it's still violence, even if they're mad. I do not have a gun or a baton. Had I put on a police uniform and pounded him with a baton, that would have been torture. This way, I'm just, uh, well, um, I'm certainly in the wrong. I am, I am, of course. You don't solve problems with violence, but sometimes violence is necessary. That's my conviction. I'm definitely not a pacifist. Igor said that about once a week, he tells everyone in the committee, you need to be prepared to go to prison. He does. He literally says it? 
We discuss it. You go to the prosecutor or police leadership and you say to their face, your employees commit crimes, your employees screw up. These people, they have the power to go, this Romanov guy is getting on my nerves. He's been here, what, 10-15 times? Deal with him already. So yes, the team, we all, I mean, I can't speak for everyone, but I do feel that sooner or later they might, you know, um, you morally prepare your family. In case something happens, my wife knows the, the what's and how's and where's. I really hope it doesn't come to it, but I'd rather have her ready for anything as, uh, as opposed to, to if she panics, you know. This is your merch. This is our merch. I'm not entirely happy with this cat. Why? Because, in my opinion, he's not alert. He's a kind of, he's, uh, he's lazy. He's not uh, bouncing, not even primed to pounce. I mean, come on. He doesn't look like a mascot of a team of activists that, uh, that, that are ready to charge and put a cop behind bars. It, it, it doesn't, it just, it just doesn't click in my head. Vladislav Vorobyov's case, he came to us for help in November 2019 and said that some police officers arrested him near his house. They brought him to the police station and began field work, so to speak. They led me to their office, brought a tow rope and started going, OK, time to confess. I was confused, of course. I started asking them, what's happened? Tell me. One of them went, don't play stupid. We know. You burned the cars near the car shop. I went, what? What cars? What car shop? I said, I didn't do it. I would never do it. They went, well, you've got five minutes to confess. Then we'll run some stress tests on you. I swore to them. I said, I'd swear on anything that it wasn't me. They took my phone, made me unlock it, started snooping around and checking call records. Then one of them said he was frigging sick of it, only he didn't say frigging. He pushed me towards the floor. I mean, he took me by the shoulder and started pushing me down. They sat me down and handcuffed my arms behind my back and uh, I couldn't even turn my hands. They've crossed my legs tied the tow rope from from the ankle to the calf all the way up there. Uh, they uh, tightened it, started pushing my legs under me, pushed my legs under me. I was in the so-called lotus position. I heard them call it uh, watching, the, watching the telly. They started pushing my torso to the floor. I started choking, feeling sick. I was seeing stars, feeling like I'm about to faint. So I started screaming mom and stuff because I was losing control from the pain. When I said uh, that I couldn't breathe, uh, one of them sat on my back and uh, started bouncing on it like on a spring, pushing me even lower to the floor. The other one said, if you don't confess right now, we'll introduce you to PR-74. They pulled down my pants. I realized, uh, I heard them taking pictures too. I started, I started screaming, yes, yes, it was me. What do you need? I'll sign anything. Just please stop beating me. They went, no, that won't do. You'll tell us how it happened, all in detail. But I had no idea how it happened, you know? After the army, I joined the police and uh, I was an interrogator. You come to the HR and tell them you want to join. You bring them all the paperwork you have. The police, like any state agency, they love their paperwork. They want all the reference letters from your college, the army, anything you have. You sit down with the counselor. It's a five-minute conversation. Are you sure about this? Do you want it? Do you know that the insomnia will drive you crazy? You positive you want this? Are you? I see. Another simpleton. 
Okay, you're approved for the job. I started naming all the car shops that I knew in town, just randomly. Uh, they started asking multiple choice questions. If, uh, if you answer correctly, the questioning continues. If you answer wrong, pick the wrong answer. They will smack you on the head, and then later, gradually, I put together the picture of what happened from their right answers. They uh, then kept me at this police station overnight. One field team left, another cop stayed. They printed out a script I had to follow. When talking to the case officer, they said the lawyer and the case officer will be here in the morning, tell them the story. If you don't, well, they would continue torturing me. They also brought up my brother and his friend and made me implicate them. They told me what to say and beat me until I did. After that, some city police officers arrived. The city police officers brought a tow rope as well. They brought me to this first room and started punching me in the torso and the shoulder and kicking me. Then they noticed the large windows and told the other cops, how do you work here? You are right in the open. Then they took me to a room with smaller windows. They gave me two guilty statements to sign and also two cold cases. They wanted to pin these two unsolved cases that they had on me, two arsons of a car and a mole from 2016 and 17. He was just mad crazy. They wanted to pass me off as this nut job that runs around setting things on fire like some kind of an arson man. Then they took me to this case officer. I told the case officer everything the script said and uh, then they filmed me. They said it was for, for their higher-ups to, to pass on. They brought this public defender who just snoozed through the whole thing. They took me back to the building where they tortured me. The case officer from the city arrived. He questioned me, but the questioning was in front of those cops from before. He left the room. One of the city cops, I still remember, had a, had a holstered gun. He said, they should shoot come like you. If I see you again, I'll shoot you in the head. Uh, then he took out his gun and pointed it at me. Uh, were they all sober? Yes, as far as I could tell, they were, they were all there. One of them even brags that he doesn't drink at all. They brought me to the courthouse where I finally saw my brothers. One of them I had uh, implicated under torture. I, uh, I told my brothers what happened. They said, tell the judge what they, what they did to you. To which the case officer that questioned me said, uh, wait, you didn't set those cars on fire. I said, of course I did, and they tortured me to say it. Before the hearing, the case officer said, don't tell the judge the truth. They're here to decide your mobility limitation. I said, no, I'm telling what happened. During the hearing, I got up and said, said what happened. The judge left the room, then came back, and instead of uh, sending me to detention, placed me under house arrest and banned certain things, like the internet and cell phones. So, after that, I hired a lawyer, we recorded a video message. I only confessed because I knew that they wouldn't let me leave. They, they would continue to batter and torture and potentially rape me until I, until I confessed. Then the committee for the prevention of torture contacted me and I told them my story. I was an interrogator. I quit after less than a year. The job didn't just sit right with me. I just, uh, I just didn't enjoy it. There were no outrageous acts or incidents. Everybody who asks assumes that something terrible happens, which forced me to quit. No, nothing terrible happened, just the general atmosphere and the way the system is set up didn't, didn't work for me at the time.
I, it wasn't like a plan to quit the police and join the committee for the prevention of torture. I learned about the committee by chance on Headhunter, like three months after quitting the force. I learned about the fact that torture is so ubiquitous and that there were incidents even, even at my old police station just after I joined the committee. Nobody really talks about these things. It's not like a water cooler topic. It's low profile work that only field officers and their superiors know about. Not everyone at the police station even knows what the place is like at night. I wonder about that too, of course. Why did they grab me specifically? I'm, I'm not antisocial. I've, uh, I've always fought illegal sale of alcohol. Maybe that's why. My cousin had a, had a run-in with the police. Maybe, maybe they wanted to use me like, uh, like as a bargaining chip. Well, that is one of my guesses, one of the options. What was the run-in with the police? Well, here is what I know. He, he had a conflict with them because he, he runs a security firm and uh, they, maybe they wanted to take it over, I don't know. As for our part, we conducted a public investigation and found that at least by our standards uh, and the standards set forth by the European Court of Human Rights, Article 3 of the Convention Prohibition of Torture was indeed violated. Additionally, it was violated both in that he was subjected to torture and in that the inspection of this case, that it is, in our opinion, ineffective. He contacted us in December. We conducted an investigation and reported the crime the same month. To this day, the case has no suspects. There's not even a criminal case. The current stance of the investigation is that Vorobyov was arrested, but uh, resisted arrest, and uh, all the injuries he sustained resulted from his resistance to the police officers who arrested him and tried to lay him on the ground, after which they brought him to the police station. But the nature of injuries described in the, in the medical record conform more to, to the Vorobyov's version. The arson happened on the night of November 19th, I, had I been alone at home at the time, this uh, wouldn't have been an alibi, but uh, the way things worked out that day, I had a rock-solid alibi. If uh, we check chronologically on the 19th, uh, my girlfriend and I went to Ufa on a personal business. We went mall shopping and uh, after that we went, we used uh, BlaBlaCar car sharing, which registered the trip. Uh, it registered that we got in at this mall. I requested the footage from the mall security. They provided it. Then my girlfriend and I split and she went to this memorial service. I met with some friends and we went to a mall to buy ingredients to make burgers at home. Well, uh, same thing. There were receipts as well as mall security, camera footage and then somewhere around uh, uh, somewhere around 11 p.m. I got a cab through Yandex Taxi. It's an app, right? As you know it. Uh -huh. It shows the driver, the car, uh, the pickup time. The taxi driver uh, confirmed that I was in this car at that moment. When uh, I was in the cab, the arson was happening somewhere in the town. They never charged me. They archived the case. Just like that. I'm still qualified as a suspect, but the case has stalled. The lawyer explained that the case would remain in the archive until the statute of limitations runs out. What happens at the police station when the suspect is alone with a field officer? I'd like to bring up something for illustration purposes. The, the case of uh, Denis Yumagulov, it's from 2017. This happened uh, in the settlement of Chishmi. They detained uh, Denis under the pretext of drug crime prevention. They said they'd go to the hospital for some routine tests to see to see if you are on anything or not. We'll go from there. Instead, they brought him to the police station and started working with him. 
We have all these cold cases, take on a few. He obviously refused. Afterwards, they put him in the administrative offender cell and would now and then bring him out to the conversation in the field cop's office where, where they sat. Let's say there were two cops. One of them would call him to talk. Then the other one. Then the first one would, would call him and punch him a few times. They started mounting the psychological pressure. If they thought it wasn't enough, they would beat him again. If the pressure is sufficient, they don't hurt the person. We have loads of latent criminal abuse of power. Uh, most of the situations don't reach the torture stage because uh, cops break the victim by just talking. We usually call it uh, officer access. Uh, one of the policemen that was eventually convicted started pounding Dennis and at some points through this, uh, as Dennis described it, clumsy and awkward blow, missing his mark basically, and ruptured Dennis's spleen. He obviously required medical attention. Uh, there was nothing the cop could do. He messed up. He was the last person to beat Dennis as well. There was no escaping. He ended up being convicted. And the most interesting part, and uh, something I only saw uh, once in my career, uh, was that he admitted his guilt, confessed to the crime, and pleaded guilty. When he was asked the question uh, that everybody had in their mind, why did you do it? He gave a very simple and prosaic answer, to improve the solved crime statistics. If somebody ends up at the police station, how do they avoid being tortured? Is there a more or less, like, universal method? No. No, there isn't. Forget universal. There is no method that would guarantee that you don't get tortured. There is none. I'm saying this with complete confidence. If there was, we would have told about it ages ago instead of harassing the government to introduce measures to prevent torture. We would have simply taught people how to avoid it. We've had mayors become torture victims, we've had police generals become torture victims. No amount of power or money could save these people. I mean, they tortured completely random people. You see, they, they just simply walked into the fields of view of a policeman who thought that this person could be appointed as uh, the guilty party in the crime that they need to solve by tomorrow morning. Somov and Kasterin went to prison. Uh, when they got out, they worked as guards, as far as I know. I don't know where, where they worked. My mother told me that she met Kasterin at a store where, where he worked as a guard. She came up to him and, uh, well, shamed him, so to speak. She said, how can you look me in the eye? You tortured my son. You left him a cripple. He crippled two people, myself and my mother, who is also a cripple in a way, because she spent the last 20 years by my side. No nights out, no vacations. She basically can't leave my side. What did he tell her? Nothing. He looked down. What did he tell you? He, he just left, he switched, they put a different guard, he ran from the conversation. He hid in the back, back room and uh, didn't talk to her. You've had friends in all law enforcement agencies. Yes. Some people believe that there are no honest policemen out there. I strongly disagree. Uh, they're thinking, you work at a police station, you're an honest fella, you chose this job because you watched, I don't know, Chuck Norris movies or a Street of Broken Light series, where honest cops fought crime as best as they could. And uh, you want to do honest work, but at the same time, you know that they might torture people at your station and you do nothing about it. You just accept it. You don't do it yourself, but... You don't whistleblow either. Uh, I mean, do you still count as an honest policeman? No, I don't think so. Definitely not. At the same time, the guys um, I was friends with uh, tried not to think about it because it's, uh, well, well, you know, um, there is this term in Orwell's novel, self-stop. 
it's the realization that if you continue your current train of thoughts uh, one bite further, you'll have to make drastic changes to your life or life will become really uncomfortable. They too stop at this threshold. This um, friend of mine that dragged me into this village and uh, settled me here all those years ago, he was a commander at the uh, Omon squad. He made over a dozen trips to Chechnya during the wars. He's not an idiot. He is an educated fella. He went to teacher's college, uh, he used to uh, write poetry, etc., but life stuck him into this service. And throughout the 25 years that I knew him, he always pretended to be an idiot. He always tried to look dumb, unthinking, um, that, uh, that was a fake. But by the end of his life, this mask had fused with him. He spent many years pretending to be an uh, ignoramus that... Uh, you would uh, that you would sick and he would bite that our duty is simple pursue close and kill the case officer will sort the right from wrong later that's about the way their reasoning works they're not exactly idiots or sadists but but many of them are like that they figure on the one hand, the police is necessary. On the other hand, to be a successful police officer, you need to torture, you need to embellish, you need to ignore unpromising crime reports, and on promising ones, you want to break every stick in half, and uh, as they say, to uh, get more points on this scale, or to get higher on this graph, they loathe it, they hate to do it, they work like like, like those cops from the streets of broken lights there is uh, there is a great uh, symbolic line in the show's theme song though the game is rigged we'll get through guys to be an effective cop you need to break the law and they accept it from there having uh, realized that unlike the law your conscience can help you go places they turn their conscience and their subjective understanding of uh, justice into their big guiding star, into their compass. And everybody's conscience is different, more so in different scenarios. Conscience tends to mutate. I believe it does. The friend from your trip, what happened to him? Do you know? Uh, I don't know. We don't keep in touch. I heard that he joined, uh, joined the police force after what's happened. Uh, did you ever blame him for basically I implicating you? I didn't expect such libel from him, but I realized that he did it for a reason. Something made him write it. I, I understand that they told him what to write. As far as I know, he's never killed anybody, so he couldn't have known all the, those details with the agony and stuff. So they probably told him what to write. But there had to be some form of pressure, like threats or torture, because he didn't just sign it, he wrote the whole thing. We were desk mates at school, and I know his handwriting. Oh, so he's a childhood friend. Yeah, we became friends in the first year. Best friends and uh, desk mates. We, we served in the army together. Our bunks were next to each other. We went to college together and even worked together before the army. The European court made a ruling with a huge compensation, and yes, two cops were convicted. I also heard they put bars there. Yes. Rulings of the European court distinctly specify the so-called individual measures. For, for example, Mikheyev was paid 250,000 euros as a compensation, and the court also demanded that the perpetrators were sentenced. And there are so-called general measures, meaning that the state has to take preventative measures to stop this from happening again. Or, in Russian legal terms, identify the factors that facilitated this tragedy and take steps to prevent it in the future.
You know, somehow to convince the field staff that they need to obtain proof lawfully and convince the investigators that they should try and solve these cases before the European court gets involved. Well, the general measures that the Russian government took in this situation were to put bars on the window. So the person cannot jump out. So the next time they torture somebody, the person can't jump out of the window. The European Court of Human Rights awarded you 250,000 euros as compensation. Did you get it? Did Russia pay you up? Yes, they did. But uh, it all went to cover all our uh, like medical expenses. That's why they awarded me such an enormous compensation. The the European court doesn't normally do that. They are, they're usually just token sums. In uh, my case, they awarded such a huge compensation because we had substantial medical expenses. Where do you get the money today, Alexei? Pension, disability pension. How big is it? I don't know how it's formed, but I understand that I also get reimbursed for medication. In total, it's about 20,000 rubles. My mother is a pensioner too, but because she had to quit her job, she was assigned the minimal pension, MROT, basically. Initially, she didn't get anything at all. Before she reached 60, uh, she, she wasn't considered a pensioner. Uh, she was simply unemployed. The state paid her 50 rubles for looking after a disabled person. 50 rubles, one bill a month. Mm. When she turned 60, she, she started receiving her old age pension. And, uh, and now we receive two minimal pensions between us. Her minimal pension, my disability pension, and the medical reimbursement that we take in cash. Uh, so it's, well, a tiny bit more. You can receive the medication itself or maybe monetize it, but it's peanuts. It's, it's like 2,000 or something. They reimburse another 1,000 rubles for utility bills. That's all we have right now. That's it. Nothing. Has the government ever helped you? We apply for financial help at the City Directorate of Internal Affairs pretty much every year. In the 20 years, we received it twice. Both times, it was 4,000 rubles or something. Okay, fine. But in the last 23 years, uh, Nizhny Novgorod elected several mayors and governors. Not one of them, when they were running for office or something, offered you better living conditions or or i don't know or just help they were they were the same people we talked to city council members we went to the court the the court ruled and i had this ruling somewhere that there were no grounds to improve my living conditions you see even if not improve, at least make them bearable let, let me let me move from the second floor to the ground floor Alexei, your mother used to be an architect, is that correct? She has an architect's degree and used to work for a construction company. And she quit when all this happened? Yes, yes. You were 29 at the time, and your mother? She was 42. I have four diplomas. After high school, I graduated from a motor transport tech school. And uh, then I went to a tech university with the same major. Then I, then I worked towards a degree. Uh, when I joined the police, I went to police school. After the injury, I went to this law school. It was called the Nizhny Novgorod Commercial Institute. Now it's part of the NGU, the Nizhny Novgorod State University. Uh, so I also got a law degree from the NGU through distance learning. Yet you couldn't find a suitable job. For a time, like uh, 10 years ago, I worked as a lawyer in a disability organization for several years. What do you dream of? My dreams are very short term. They are always two hours away. After I go to the bathroom, I dream of successfully doing it again in two hours.
Because if I can't do it at home, I'll have to call an ambulance and go to the hospital so they'd cut my bladder out and drain the urine directly, so to speak, but by puncturing, puncturing my bladder. You used to work with Valeria Novodvorska in the 90s. You uh, used to be in the same movement. Yes, used she to be. chewed you up when you joined the Union for Human Rights. She cursed me, so to speak. She didn't just chew me up. She said, I'll never shake his hand. She believed that by joining this body, you pledged allegiance to Putin. No, no, it wasn't that. She believed uh, that you couldn't make peace with this government. Uh, was she right after all? I don't think so. I don't think so. I believe for a politician, this was more or less legitimate and justifiable stance. I believe uh, for a human rights defender, it's unacceptable rigidity. Certainly, a regime that stubbornly refuses to change will sooner or later have to have a revolution on its hands, uh, in the worst sense of that word, with riots and blood, and will probably get replaced by an even harsher regime. It's what always happened historically, always. You have to pressure it. You have to force it to change. And most importantly, the nation needs to, uh, to do it. People in this country grumble at home and at work, but to do it openly, publicly, to demand change, I guess they they must have physically wiped it out along with several million of the best of and the brightest. We lost this culture here. We The culture of grumbling, you mean? The culture the, of open political protest. When did we lose it? In the middle of the last century? For the most part, yes. Yes. And the few people that uh, are willing to do it outside of their homes and offices are subjected to substantial pressure. They don't shoot anyone. When they sentence them, it's not for that long. But the nation rejects these people. Uh, that's the interesting part. They marginalize these people. They think of them as uh, the, the town crazies. They think of them as failures. They're not popular. They should just work, you know? They should open business and prove that they're worth something. Instead, they protest because... Uh, so in the minds of the majority, Navalny and Luba Sobol are not freedom fighters and heroes, but freaks, as considered by the majority. To me, they are freedom fighters and heroes, without a doubt. Besides, after this uh, entire story with Navalny, I never was a big fan of his, but uh, you can't just brush aside the honesty and the courage of his return to Russia from, from Germany. I, I thought it would make a very strong impression and, uh, and, and, and the nation uh, it would take to the streets and voice a resounding protest. I expected crowds of people to finally come out because it was, uh, it was a very brave decision, a martyr's decision. You know, a, a little more than usual. You have the coat of arms of the Federal Protective Service on the wall. How come? Well, I have uh, an unexpected circle of friends. Uh, there is one buddy of mine. Uh, he's from Nizhny Novgorod. Uh, I once learned by chance that it was the FSB day that day. Um, I wanted to uh, congratulate him at the CHR, at the presidential administration. They had uh, a little shop with all kinds of FSB-themed uh, paraphernalia. And I bought this pennant. Uh, only when I got here, I realized that uh, they've been two different agencies uh, for ages now, for like 20 years or so. FSO uh, wasn't a part of FSB anymore. And and uh, this gift was inappropriate. See this teapot? It says Ministry of Defense. Shoigu personally gave it to a close friend of mine. 
When the Crimea thing happened, she went to the dumpster to throw it out. Uh, she had a big box of teapots and all kinds of crap uh, with this logo. And uh, at the last moment, when she was about to empty the box into the dumpster, I said, can I have it? I have a place in the country. Breaking a promise here, I said, no journalist will ever film it. I never bring anybody here. <laughs> uh, I could use this set. I've got an entire Ministry of Defense set. But you're a hoarder, aren't you? Uh, I'm an old grand piano. First off, serving on the CHR, I mean early on, uh, and this is why I joined it in the first place, I was able to present undeniable proof. You simply can't dispute a stack of 30 court rulings that declare a case officer actions unlawful, all right? I got sick and tired of fighting police captains and majors. For a long time, I'd wanted to tell Mr. Bastrykin directly and, uh, and, and tell him, this subordinate of yours has been persistently performing his duties inadequately for the last eight, for the last eight years. Not my words, the court says. He's made 30 rulings over the last eight years, and the court deemed them all unlawful. It's an indisputable fact. The judiciary said so, the court said so. During this time, he was paid a salary. During this time, he wasted resources and enjoyed a government car with lights. But also during this time, he got two more stars on his uh, shoulder straps. How is it possible? Does this mean you, as a manager, are happy with his work? I thought I'd get bah. into the CHR and be able to... Uh, get access to the security agency execs to ask them uncomfortable questions. Publicly, too. That's very important. There are easier ways to get into Bastrykin's office, make an appointment or something. Sooner or later, you'll get it. This, this was all about the publicity. Did you succeed? I did. I did. Initially, for like a couple of years, they tried to mumble back. But it's been at least six years, probably more, uh, since they stopped going to CHR events if they know that uh, Kalyapin is attending. I genuinely believed that if these uh, senior uh, execs, who on paper didn't break any laws themselves, started getting publicly asked, why do your subordinates systematically break the law? Well, you not only don't react and uh, don't punish it, you incentivize it. Do you do this on purpose? Do you mean to incentivize unlawful actions? Igor, uh, we're filming this after your meeting with the federal council, is that right? Ministry of Justice, please. Ministry of Justice, the agency that governs the FSIN system here. I understand. The Ministry of Justice is busy. Gotta work on that foreign agent list. How do you feel about Gulagu.net and what they did uh, this fall? If you mean the release of the... Savelyev's archive. Savelyev's archive. Savelyev's archive uh, needed to be released to the public, no doubt. And the best thing they could do was to release it. Golago.net did it. Well, kudos to them. Vladimir Osechkin often criticizes your work. One of the worst of sin facilities, infamous for, for the abuse, torture and rape of inmates, Igor Kalyapin from the so-called Committee for the Prevention of Torture, went there and wrote that, um, well, they posed for pictures, counted blankets, checked out the showers, but didn't check out, confirm or expose any of the torture allegations that were there. He specifically has a problem with the official inspections that you and uh, Mr. Fedotov went on to the Irkutsk Detention Center in 2019. Uh, how would you respond to him? First off, it wasn't an inspection. I mean, the council, uh, the, the president's council periodically uh, visits different regions, right? Uh, 
And over the course of two days, we make a list of uh, issues in uh, this particular region. To this end, uh, a whole bunch of different people from uh, all kinds of uh, areas of interest visit different organizations. On this visit to the detention center, we weren't doing an inspection. We merely checked out several of the cells and looked at the amenities that they had or, or maybe didn't have the inmates' mattresses, the foods, and etc. While a proper inspection of a facility, it, well, it takes several days takes even longer to put together what is called a legal supplement. And as for Mr. Osechkin, uh, well, he chose a particular style of work where he collects complaints from convicts and their families from around the country and redirects them to various... Uh, well, he doesn't redirect them, he just sends them to the investigative committee. That's it, that's all he does. If he had tried to get even a single case to fruition in the form of, uh, of a conviction, if he, he tried to investigate himself, I would have accepted his claims. We don't have the resources to operate in all regions and conduct our investigations in all regions. We operate in six regions. We don't operate in Irkutsk and never have. Uh, the visit Fedotov and I paid to the detention center in Irkutsk was part of a a CHR trip that didn't entail reviews or inspections. Igor, uh, then why do you waste your time on these trips? By 2019, Irkutsk CISO number one already had the reputation of the epicenter of torture in Irkutsk Oblast. Many people knew that. In 2019, you were there with an inspection. A year later, rumors became publicly known facts. In this detention center, a heating coil exploded in an inmate's rectum. Uh, that 75 inmates officially reported uh, sexual abuse. It becomes official. The place is hell on earth. And your visit a year prior does look like a part of an, I don't know, elaborate act and a way to sell a pretty picture, uh, which makes you look, to put it politely, well, bad. I must disagree. The thing is, um, in, in my opinion, the more visits these fenced facilities uh, will get from, uh, let's say, human rights activists, journalists and uh, members of the public, uh, the better and more facts like these will come to light and the easier it will be to push to investigate them. But this doesn't mean that if he, somebody, say, journalist dude, went to the CISO in uh, Irkutsk or, or else, or any other one, to meet with a particular convict or RST who'd reported something, uh, did an interview with them and uh, shared it with the public, this would not mean that Yuri Dut had conducted an inspection of this detention center and there were no other issues at the facility beyond the subject of the video. But if I was aware that they tortured at this facility and it was widely known, and they showed me their great museum and the outstanding mattress situation, I would be certain that I'm being lied to. I'd be certain that they prepared for my visit and took me for an idiot. I would think that they used me. Wait, how did they use you? Because Later, the person... You'd say it afterwards. Uh, they, are, they are good on mattresses, a great museum indeed. At the same time, I know that they torture people here. And I felt that I was being lied to. That's yes. pretty much what I... Did you say this after your visit to Irkutsk CISO? They didn't... I didn't say anything to sum up the visit. No, nobody asked me if they tortured people there or not. I received several reports there. I passed these reports. I just... Just like Mr. Osechkin, I passed these reports to the investigative committee because 
Our organization, Committee for the Prevention of Torture, does not operate in Irkutsk. We can't babysit these cases. All I could do was hand them to the investigative committee, which I did. When somebody interviewed me after the trip, I said, during my visit to the detention center, I received several reports, some of them regarding torture. I passed them to the investigative committee and the head prosecutor of the Irkutsk Oblast. Igor, uh, do you feel that maybe CHR visits like this one take away from your reputation and your achievements. On the one hand, you put all these bastards in Nizhny Novgorod and Orenburg Oblast behind bars. Bastards that torture and abuse people. Here you become, even if inadvertently, a participant of rotten Potemkin's tours. Why? I will explain why. The thing is, we must sit around here at the Committee for the Prevention of Torture and complain all the live long day uh, that torture is happening, that torture goes unpunished, etc. We need real change. And if we want things to change, we have no choice but to sometimes interact with the unpleasant people who hold authority and surround it. We have to interact with the leadership of the prosecution service. We have to interact with the leadership of the investigative committee. We have to interact with the political leadership, like deputies, uh, senators, and so on and so forth, who often know nothing and wish to do nothing. But if we want things in this country to change for the better, we have to interact with them. And being on this council is my only way to, uh, whether we are considered foreign agents or not, I have no other ways to reach the space where decisions are being made, but through this presidential council. I don't have any other channels to reach the authorities left. But your answers during the sit-down part of this interview indicated that it's the government's fault that things are this way. And of that, course. That it wouldn't benefit the government if these things changed. Correct. Then isn't it Sisyphean labor? It is 95% Sisyphean labor. You still got to look for arguments, and I believe we successfully do time to time. That would put an end to the outrage of torture. I'm trying to sell them the idea of a safer country for them too, because when the problem of torture gets out of control, when it gets way too big, it threatens the authorities themselves. That's what I'm trying to tell them. And occasionally, I somewhat succeed. It's not just the Slovakia who torture. People in their grasp commit torture too. Correct. One of the cases that the Committee for the Prevention of Torture sought to conviction was the warden of the Orenburg prison. The warden and the deputy warden. They were both convicted. The two key figures in the prison. Yes. Colonel and uh, Lieutenant Colonel, I believe. They used two convicts as construction workers for their cottages. Yes, yes, yes. In exchange for parole, right? In exchange for parole. They ended up breaking their promise. That's right. The convicts started to protest. So they got other convicts to rape one of them? Yes. And they actually filmed it? They did it personally. They didn't order somebody to film it. They were both personally present. The warden and his deputy. They filmed this convict being lowered, i.e. forced to act of sexual nature. They filmed it all on camera, all the while explaining to him and to the group of present activists, uh, going, if you misbehave, this video will go online. How did he manage to report this? He, he reported it. I believe he reached out to us after his release. His, uh, his sentence was uh, almost over. He contacted us and told us everything in full detail. Uh, what's the idea here and why do they use acts of sexual nature? Uh, 
they they expect the victim to to keep their mouth shut not every man especially if they live by the so-called code would risk uh, sharing this in full detail most raped girls don't go to the police well most don't because because they're embarrassed to talk about it imagine what it's like for a guy particularly the codified guy I understand that all human rights activists have common causes, but there's still competition between organizations. Have you envied Gulagu.net at all this fall, considering the hype they generated with Savelyev's archive? I envied their luck that Savelyev came to them, yes, although I do believe that they earned it, because all the Gulagu.net does for human rights is a post-victim report. So it makes sense that Savelyev came to them. It would, it would have been even better if he had come to us, I guarantee it. Savelyev says that he did contact the committee. You say he didn't. Of course not. Are you sure? Well, do I you don't... review all appeals? I I don't know. I have people in my staff responsible for for the incoming mail. They report all such messages to me. Here is an example. And uh, uh, I just got back from Kirov Oblast. I went there because we were contacted by an employee of the facility who was willing to share similar records from the Kirov prison. He turned out to be a conman, as you might expect. He said he could bring the footage out, but he needed a hard drive. He asked if we would transfer him a small sum so he would go and buy it. We, 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 we took the risk. I transferred him the money, but obviously there was neither the employee nor the footage. Committee for the Prevention of Torture had an office in Chechnya for a long time. Yes. It no longer operates. Sadly. Because it got destroyed. Three times. By who? The proper term is vigilantes. They are these groups of citizens that, uh, well, they aren't officially Slovaki or the authorities, but are sort of like the authorities' uh, thug task force. Emerald green attacks, physical assaults, uh, egging, or maybe something like this. Because uh, being a government agent, you, well, you can't really destroy an office or throw flour on, on Kalyapin, you know? You get upset when you hear stories from Chechnya. Yes. Uh, you said you noticed that it's uh, spreading. As one of my friends said, uh, Chechnya is a test site for practices that will later become countrywide. In Chechnya, the freedom, the saplings of freedom, they didn't die. They went into a deep um, hibernation. This uh, stuff is dangerous. Over, over there, it's dangerous. It's been smoothered. And it is sort of already spread to the rest of Russia because I don't segregate Chechnya from Russia. Chechnya is Russia. And now it's come to us. I'm talking about uh, the uh, accelerating wheel of repressions that society can't really slow down anymore. What scares me is um, still in the indifference. Uh, is it real? It is, yes. It's always been real. And because it's uh, real, it, this stuff came to other uh, regions. It spread it because we were indifferent to the stories from uh, Chechnya. You're a regular Joe. Say you work at a sushi bar. We had a claimant like that. They picked him up and he went missing. Reading certain blogs, following certain telegram channels. If they find that on your phone in Grozny, and you are a local, odds are they won't leave you alone. You're lucky if they let you go. If they merely beat you up and let you go, count yourself lucky as well. We get tons of messages from people going, they took my relative, they found something on his phone, now he's missing. Movsa Romarov's case comes to mind. He worked at a sushi bar. Some people drove up, as witnesses told us, 
They put him in the car and drove away. They even showed him to the, his family, going, we have him, you can bring him food. He messaged his wife, saying that he's getting released. Then, after a while, they went, you know, there was a special operation. He went somewhere, we didn't see where exactly, and he's gone. They promised his wife, we'll let him go. Promised his mother too. Salman Tepsurkaev's case. Accused of being one of the moderators at the ADAT Telegram channel. Same thing. They kidnapped the kid, made him publicly, on camera, sit on a bottle. They made several more videos where he says uh, that he's doing great. And then he went missing. Both cases have been going since 2020. It's been over a year. The odds that these guys are alive are very, very slim. The investigation is done very ineffectively. The case officer for Movsa Numarov's case openly said that I'm not going to inspect the crime scene at the Omon base where you want me to go. I have enough information. We said he was seen at the office. Go and look. Find the people his family described. We did the case officer's work for him. We found Tepsurkaev's kidnapper's car. We found it in the village, we took pictures and even filmed it. We said, here's the car, let's go inside. You'll ask about the car. I'm not going, no, I don't want to. We found and identified the people from security footage that have kidnapped Tepsurkaev. They are law enforcement officers. We have their names, their ranks, their place of work. They have tons of pictures together on Instagram. Mr. Case Officer, go, question them. I'm not gonna. Why? Because I'm not gonna, that's it. And every case is like that. Whenever the Siloviki are involved in Chechnya, it is impossible to get an effective investigation. In the time the committees existed, you've gotten zero Siloviki from Chechnya convicted. After the committee's formation, there were some prior. During the war, before Kadyrov's power was established, there were several Siloviki on the Russian side uh, that we did convict for, uh, for the things they did to civilians. After that, zero. After that, zero. Under Kadyrov, zero. That's what, the way to put it. What motivated you to keep going? Oh, considering that it wasn't working out. I completely disagree with that. Let me reiterate that our main goal, the goal of protecting the individual, is sacred. No questions there. But there is a bigger goal. We need this torture machine to stop. We need to break it. We need to jam it. We need to get the state to adapt laws and procedures that will work automatically. You must realize that the people we help are are just a drop in the bucket. In the last 20 years, we put 150 criminals behind bars. You, well, you must realize that it's nothing compared to the scale of the issue. Our goal, I openly say this to everybody, and people always look with condemnation, our goal is not to help the individual. We do it along the way properly too. We've never abandoned or let anyone down. But our main goal is to create the mechanisms in this country that would wipe out the practice of torture and make resorting to it too dangerous, too risky, and make the investigative committee stick to what the law says instead of making deals with heads of police stations. That is our goal. We didn't achieve it in Chechnya. But we did make good progress. Who lives in this village? There are probably three families in total, with um, people of uh, working age. One is a truck driver, another one is a forest ranger, the third one owns two tractors. He occasionally gets commissioned by the local administration to do this or that, like cover up a road. And there's an administration here? Else. Absolutely. Oh. There's always an administration and a cabin with a Russian flag. There isn't always electricity, but the cabin with a Russian flag is a must. There is also a few dozen pensioners, you know. It's noon, but we've already met some people who um, wanted a drink. Last time these people came to me asking for a drink at 2.30 a.m. Today. Today. They came again at noon. 
Of course, that's a big gap for them. Down here, people drink hard. Seriously, you wouldn't even believe me. You said the locals had some kind of special drink. Yes, since uh, since few of them have the finances to buy vodka, the people's drink of choice here is uh, Visnushka lotion. It's uh, almost pure alcohol with some crap added in. Since it says on the bottle that it's a freckle removing solution, but uh, but it's ninety six percent alcohol. How much is it? Sixteen rubles, I think. Sixteen rubles. Yes. 350 grams. Why doesn't Vladimir Putin react to this? Well, it's not that he doesn't react per se. Uh, last time I talked uh, at him for over 20 minutes, my CHR colleagues wanted to lynch me afterwards because I took up the time of three speakers. But for 23 minutes, repeating myself and all, I explained to him the absolute necessity of certain steps that would at least put an end to the practice of torture and stop it from spreading. He listened me out, he nodded, and instead of an answer, he told a story that, according to one of my colleagues, there was a legal training program for the Afghan Sarandoyans, they were called, right? The Afghans that fought for the legitimate government of uh, Barba Karmal. We taught them proper interrogation techniques that observed the socialist principles. It spanned one month and uh, at the end one of the students an Afghan uh, well obviously an Afghan uh, who else would Putin talk about this in in this context uh, raised his hand and said I have a question they turned off electricity at the base yesterday how am I supposed to secure proof without electricity he was like they taught him how to investigate properly for a month. He still asked, how to work without electricity? Point being, uh, uh-huh. electrocution is a standard proof-getting technique. If the generator is off, how do I? Uh, how did he mean? Uh, your guess is as good as mine. It's basically an exact quote. I believe that his point was, we keep telling them the right way to do it, but they are still like like that. What are you going to do about it? Well, you see? Oh, he meant that we similarly teach the Russian Ex- police. Exactly. He couldn't make this point using the Russian police, could he? He had to bring up some silly Sarandoyan. I think uh, I think he made the whole story up. And uh, well, Putin actually is uh, quite competent and uh, skilled at uh, answering the questions that we throw at him. And uh, most of his answers are factual. Well, they are bad, but factual in the sense of. Oh, you, you wonder how no, that works. No, I get it. They're bedazzling non-answers, basically. Yeah. Yes. yes. Uh, uh-huh. Particularly for the viewers at home who are clueless uh, about the issue. It looks really... It's funny. It's clever. You can tell he knows the drill. Yeah, he knows how to act in such situations. In this particular case, his answer was really ineffectual. Everybody saw that he simply dodged the question. Was there a recovery period for you? I didn't leave home for like three or four months. I stayed I stayed in most of the time. You know, those videos where dogs run in their sleep. I too twitch like that in my sleep in 15 minute intervals. I had some kind of mental instability in that sense. I felt okay during the day, but when I went to bed, I had uh, I had the shakes in my sleep. And uh, I still sometimes see those cops in my dreams, the taser, the getting into the police car. I fear it's left a lasting mark on my psyche. Today, if, uh, God forbid, something bad happens to me, like somebody steals my wallet or something like that, I I will think twice about going to the police. Because uh, what if they don't like my face again? Or what if they find some other reason?
Well, and uh, when I walk down the street and uh, I see people in law enforcement uniform, I cross to the other side of the road because I would rather stay away from people like that. What do you do in Ufa these days? I'm a mobile technology sales representative. I go to retail stores, promoting. Did you move to Ufa from Sterlitamak for work or because of the incident? The incident mostly because I couldn't work in Sterlitamak. I uh, always looked back. I didn't feel safe in that town anymore. Even though people told me, relax, they're not going to touch you again. But I don't know what to expect from them. I'm more comfortable in Ufa. I work in construction. I install ventilated facade panels high up. Oh, you're a high-rise fitter. Yes. I have a girlfriend, but I decided that until this whole thing is over, I don't want to get married or anything because I don't want anything until all this stuff is out of my head. You read the news and you know that reports of new instances of torture with electricity too uh, still come in. As I understand, nothing's changed pretty much. It's non-stop. For 20 years, the whole time the committee has operated, they post about new reports of torture almost daily. Imagine, imagine how many people don't report it or are unable to report it. I think it's omnipresent. We just don't hear about it. Why is nothing changing? Why has it been 23 years and they still torture people in Russia? Local MVD branches win from it. Uh, first off, by torturing a detainee, you can get uh, mums all up in arms, like, stop talking, don't even think of saying how you feel. She's afraid they'll cut us off and leave us pensionless because it's our only source of income, the state pension. The wheelchair, tell them about the wheelchair. Well, what about the wheelchair, Alexei? She says we can't afford a wheelchair. Tell them that, uh, that we can't uh, have no chance to buy a wheelchair. We were offered, uh, the social security offered us a wheelchair, but I can't use it. Uh, they buy cheap Chinese wheelchairs in bulk and offer them to disabled people. We, uh, we checked it out and uh, it didn't fit me. It didn't meet my conditions requirements. And the wheelchair that did fit me is a Russian-made wheelchair, but it's really expensive. How expensive? Last time I talked to this company from Moscow that makes them, Katarzyna, uh, the wheelchair costs somewhere around 140,000. But Social Security said our wheelchair budget is 40,000 per person, so uh, we can't get you that one. What do you dream of? My dream is to have justice in our country and unity of the nation. That's pretty much it. Mm. That is, There's no justice we talk globally. now. There's a tiny, tiny speck of it. But overall, the reality is that they keep torturing people. They beat testimonies out of them and, and they put them in jail. My situation, I was really lucky, I would say, really. Some people are less fortunate. They go to prison and lose years of life because somebody wanted an extra star on their shoulders. I understand there is now a separate caste of people in this country, the Siloviki. They live in a separate world and can do much more than we. They can do anything, unfortunately. Was this always the case? Or is this new? It's new. It's, it's recent. It became a reality in the last 10 years. 10 years ago, it was different. There was always abuse of power and torture, but now they feel they are absolutely masters of life. It became really apparent after the Crimea thing. I tracked down this moment. Just like the scale 
and uh, mastery of torture use increased after Chechnya, uh, they, they started using more elaborate techniques. Chechnya was a sort of uh, like, uh, like an extension course knowledge exchange, but, uh, but they felt like masters and even started talking differently. They, they openly say that human rights activists are enemies of the state. Human rights is an enemy ideology imposed on us by the West, which uh, aims to destroy Russia as a country. Uh, from the all of this from the small time cops to the high ranking generals i hear it from them all the time lately you know what did crimea thing change i can only tell you what i think i guess i guess that they felt more than anything because nothing changed legally but they finally felt like people who were like um, like their country needs them their nation needs them. Before that, they were told, you are not an elite, you, you simply perform a job. There, there are electricians and builders, etc. You are policemen. It's a job. You are not above others. This was a standard police ideology during uh, Nurgaliyev's uh, later years and uh, and Kolokoltsev's uh, early years. Then, after the whole Crimea thing, the FSB, heck, even the Vsin. I mean, what does the Vsin have to do with Crimea and this reacclaiming of lands? Nothing, right? But no, all the Siloviki became much cockier and began uh, exhibiting their sense of superiority over others. You mentioned that Orwell made a very strong impression on you uh, when you were young. You became fixated on the idea to never end up in a society that he described. Absolutely right. Uh, to be clear, you meant 1984. Yes, yes. Not Animal Farm. No, not Animal Farm. Because Animal Farm, uh, you know, uh, you can look outside yeah, and, and agreed, see it. But Animal Farm is not a terrifying read. 1984 is. I was terrified reading it, for sure. And I did think back then, you don't want to live to see it. It's best to die heroically before it happens, because that's a scary life. And uh, as, as, as an executive or an academic or a renowned uh, physicist or a minister or a president, you should not live in that kind of society. Not even shouldn't. You don't How want to. How far off is it? Well, I fear it's close. I've never actually seen such, uh, such effective methods of manipulating of uh, public opinion and mass intimidation. It really is, it's, it's really close.